I'm John Laird from the University of Michigan, and today I'm going to talk to you about the SOAR cognitive architecture and its relationship to robotic agents. I'm going to talk about its current and future capabilities. My outline is very simple. I'm going to do a little bit of a history of SOAR, describe some of its current capabilities, some of the capabilities that are currently under development, and also talk about future capabilities that I think needed to really uh, are going to be needed for future robotic systems. So the SOAR cognitive architecture started back in 1981. I was the developer along with Paul Rosenblum and Alan Newell, who's my advisor. The best reference to the system is the SOAR cognitive architecture, a book from MIT Press. It also has a GitHub page that was on my first slide, so you can access it there. In terms of the goals of the SOAR cognitive architecture, when we started out, we really wanted to build a system that could use many different methods and many different for many different tasks that could both be knowledge lean, meaning it did a lot of problem solving and search, all the way up to knowledge rich, meaning it knew exactly what to do at each point. Uh, we were inspired both by psychology and computer science. We looked to psychology for cognitive mechanisms and capabilities, and to computer science and AI for efficient and robust implementations. We focused throughout this uh, history on complex behavior and tasks, and often longer time scales, more than just a few seconds. However, within the context of that, it is important to be able to have both low and high level cognitive capabilities along the lines of system one and system two in uh, Daniel Kahneman's characterization of cognition. So the system has the, both the ability to react quickly to this, a situation uh, using its knowledge from its memories as well as doing more deliberate reasoning. The SOAR also has many different learning mechanisms and it can learn from a lot of different sources of knowledge. And throughout the development, we've really emphasized the need for efficient real-time execution, even as the knowledge grows to be very large, say millions of um, rules or millions of items in its semantic memory, all the time trying to make the system run very efficient, faster than real time. And currently SOAR runs hundreds to a thousand times faster than real time. The history of SOAR, we started out with the capability, as I mentioned, to have multiple tasks and multiple methods. Uh, we then added learning mechanisms and wanted to have a system that could be knowledge rich behavior, sort of like expert systems, but also being able to interact with the outside world. And so we've looked at task learning over the years and also modeling human capabilities. And our most recent uh, emphasis, at least at Michigan, has been on comprehensive task learning. Along the way, we've implemented a lot of different architectural mechanisms to support those capabilities, starting with a rule-based symbol system um, to adding learning mechanisms. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, we added a lot, new, a bunch of new learning mechanisms and memory systems. And recently, we've added um, a new version of our uh, procedural comp uh, composition system. Over the years, we've done many different applications. We started with toy problems, but we quickly went to uh, complex uh, real world problems like computer configuration. We've done robotics back in the 90s with a hero robot and a puma robot. And over the years, we've done a lot of different tasks, both in simulation and in robotics. And currently, SOAR has been used in autonomous vehicles for driving. Here are an example of some of the robotic platforms SOAR has been used on, back to the puma and the hero robot. Um, and over the years, we, people have used it for underwater robots or for um, you know, large vehicles. Uh, key thing here is it's not been just people at Michigan, but pe people at Penn State, people at PAL Robotics, um, SOAR Technology, all have been using SOAR for a lot of different kind of robotics applications. Recently at Michigan, we've been focusing on a few simulators, um, the ability to uh, do simulation of a robot arm and a building, and these are both based on uh, the April simulator. And also we've hooked SOAR up to the um, AI2 Thor simulator for uh, indoor house type simulation. Um, and at behavior activities. We've also been do, using real world robotics. So this is a robot arm developed by Edwin Olson's group, the, the April group. And also this is their um, small robot, mobile robot we've used. 
We also have um, SOAR embodied in the Fetch robot, and for fun, we implemented it so that it can control the Cosmo robot. So we've had been, you know, committed to a lot of having a flexibility to take the architecture and apply it to very different kinds of robots over the years. This is the basics of the SOAR architecture. It has a visual perception that goes into what we call the spatial visual system, which is a scene graph representation of the world that allows not only for images to come in from the outside world and build up a 3D model, but also for projection from long-term other memories and also for simulation. So it does have an underlying uh, game engine or, or uh, to, to do some um, forward projection of possible future worlds. Symbolic working memory holds its current understanding of the situation and its goals, and it has three different long-term memories, a procedural memory that holds uh, the skills and tasks that it can execute, that's implemented as a higher as rule-based system. We also have semantic memory that, that holds facts about the world, but also holds declarative representations of tasks while it's executing them. And episodic memory holds the system's experiences um, through time. So as symbolic working memory changes, new things are added to episodic memory and allows the system to go back and reflect on what it's done in the past and learn from that. So this is you know, the basic structure of, of SOAR. And spatial visual system is something I'll come back to in the future. So our current capabilities, as you can see, we have symbolic knowledge-based reasoning, execution, and learning. The system has on-demand and integrated hierarchical reasoning, planning, meta-reasoning. It has these long-term memories. It also has learning mechanisms. And we've implemented restricted natural language understanding and generation for doing integrated interactive task learning, which I'll talk about in a minute. We also have this visual spatial representation for mental imagery and that provides an interface between perception and motor and cognition. And as, as I said, it supports hypotheticals and projection and forward simulation. If we look to interactive task learning, this is the idea that we wanna be able to teach AI agents in real time using natural language. So the idea is that we teach it a new task from scratch using language and this, the language happens in a shared context. It's an interactive where the human makes, uh, tells the agent what to do. The agent will ask questions if there's things that are unknown. And it's really critical that the language provides precision semantics. This is real-time online one-shot learning. There's only a single interaction and the system learns a new task. And it's able to reuse knowledge learned from previous instructions so that as you teach it more and more tasks, that accumulates and it's easier to teach new tasks because you can build on what you've taught before. This is implemented in a system we call ROSI, um, where my graduate students and I have done a lot of knowledge engineering to create the knowledge comprehension and learning strategy. And it's embodied in these three different robots here, um, as well as the Cosmo. It learns office tasks, um, such as in the middle where we're teaching it to deliver something to an uh, office. Um, and we just teach it from scratch. It doesn't know anything about delivery at that time. We've also taught it 60 different puzzles and games. Here is James Kurtz's system, who is um, learning, or it's actually executing the Tower of Hanoi task immediately after it's been taught it. And here it's doing another simple game that we've taught it. So the idea is that we can do instruction in order to teach it the new task, and then it does immediate execution. It really is a great research project because it forces us to integrate all these capabilities together. Our current research is we're trying to improve the reasoning about experience, um, starting with our episodic memory system, but trying to incorporate ideas from the psychological research on event cognition and use that in order for the system to be able to learn action models on its own based on its experiences. We've also been making an emphasis on perceptual reasoning, even though we have SVS, SVS has not been connected to the long-term memories. So when we get uh, perceptual experiences, those don't get tied in with episodic memory. Episodic memory in the past has only been connected to the symbolic 
representations of the situation. And the same thing with semantic memory. We've never had perceptual memory connected up with semantic information. And so this is what we're doing right now. Here's just a block diagram of all the connections that we're um, adding to the system in order to make those connections and adding some long-term memory and uh, for visual representations that are then connected up with semantic and episodic memory. We're also expanding the motor reasoning in the system so that um, if we have a planner that can generate multiple tra tra trajectories, the system can make, do reasoning over the selection of between them based on how well they achieve different objective functions for the system. And so that is providing some top-down and feedback from the motor system that the system's able, able to reason about. In terms of interactive task learning, one of the challenges is we found that humans don't really have a good model of what the system already knows and doesn't know. And so they sometimes have to ask questions of the system in order to know what instructions are required for a task. What we're looking at is how can the system preemptively expose knowledge that it's learned over time so that it makes it easier for the human to do the instruction. How about future capabilities? Well, the big future capability is we want to have more knowledge in the system. And so there's a lot of different ways to get knowledge into the system, and I'm going to emphasize three of them right now. One is innate knowledge, that's sort of obvious, experience-based learning, and instructed and social learning. And I'm not going to talk about instructed and social learning. We've talked about interactive task learning, and we see that progressing on for how the system can learn interactively with humans. So let's go to innate knowledge. And I think it's a much bigger issue than most people think about. I mean, clearly we have innate knowledge where we want to have programming of the system to start with. But I think one of the things we want to get into our systems initially is some core knowledge. And this has been hypothesized as either innate in humans or something they learn very early in life. And this is knowledge about space, objects, and other agents. And so that little babies know a lot about objects very early in their lives. And so we want to avoid the system having to learn the basic physics of the world. We think that's something that can be programmed in to really help the system bootstrap its learning. Because if you have to learn that from scratch, it's, it's just a real challenging thing to learn. So maybe we can pre-program in sort of this basic common sense core knowledge about space, objects, agents, and time. We also think that a great thing for us to do is be able to take advantage of curated knowledge. Already out there in the world are lots of knowledge bases. There's the knowledge graph from Google, um, there's Psych and other ones. An age system uh, architecture should be able to take advantage of that and not have to learn that from scratch. Um, so we are looking at how can we integrate these knowledge bases. We've done some of that in the past, but we're planning on doing more of that. We also think that with natural language, we want to be able to extract knowledge from books and manuals. And that doesn't mean just doing what we're doing, we see with language modeling and neural nets right now, but we actually want to extract declarative representations of the meaning that's in those manuals, such as learning how to do a task from reading a manual or learning about the world from reading a book. So we think this is going to be a future area that we want to focus on. Of course, we also want to be able to incorporate pre-trained neural net models. For example, there's a lot of great work going on on how to use perceptual front ends and motor back ends that learn uh, from a, you know, extensive training, and also long-term semantic knowledge that we are seeing in transformers. How can we take advantage of that into a cognitive architecture? I think that's going to be a real challenge going forward. And two of the challenges is how do you get coherent meaning and reasoning across these different sources? from what's pre-programmed in, from what's extracted from other knowledge sources, and what comes in from a pre-trained neural net model. I think that's going to be a challenge. And also, we want all of these to be organized in a way that we can do, that they can adopt, I'm sorry, adapt and specialize with additional experience. So I think those are going to be two of the key challenges. And along those lines, we see experience-based learning is going to continue to be an area where we want to do research in. Now, we make a distinction between two kinds of experience-based learning. The first is what we call level one learning. This is architectural learning mechanisms. These mechanisms are in eight, 
innate and the learning is just effortless online it's going on all the time so episodic memory is a great example of that you can't stop learning from experience in terms of building up a, um, a history of what you've experienced in the world reinforcement learning is another great example and types of perceptual learning and others so these are things that, that I think that have been a big emphasis in cognitive architectures and we see those are going to be important going forward but there's another kind of learning that we see in humans. We call these knowledge-based learning strategies. These are where a human deliberately decides there's something they want to learn. And what these strategies do is they create experiences for level one. The simplest example of that is when you decide to say, practice the piano. That is a deliberate decision to get better at the piano. Now you can't deliberately make yourself better at the piano. You just can't say, I'm going to get better. You have to engage these level one mechanisms by doing practice. And these are actually are strategies that are really task performance strategies. But I think this expands beyond practice to experimentation where an agent decides, oh, there's something about the world that I don't understand. I need to do some experimentation. Discovery, instruction, and retrospective analysis are others examples of this. So I see this as a rich area of future work in terms of these knowledge-based learning strategies that aren't just fixed and within the system. So to conclude, I think we're making good, we've made good progress on internal symbol reasoning and learning. We've also are currently and going with enhanced modality specific reasoning memory and learning and that the future needs to find more ways of providing more knowledge i look forward to continue research in this area i think it's the most exciting area of ai right now and thank you for listening